Everyone, good afternoon. Appreciate you all coming out. Uh, if you saw my name uh, in the program and you decided to stay, I really appreciate you. Thanks so much. Um, so who am I? I am Gary Bryant, security engineer with North State Technology Solutions. So I've been in IT for about 18 years and in security for about 10 of those years. Um, my background is in telecommunications and technical support. And about 10 years ago, I started working as a private investigator on the side and did some digital forensics. And that got me really hot and heavy into the security side. Um, I currently specialize in risk management, compliance, consulting, and of course, vulnerability management. So let's get going. What's vulnerability management? It's defined as the cyclical process of identifying, classifying, remediating, and or mitigating vulnerabilities. A vulnerability here is defined as a weakness in information system security design, procedures, implementation, or internal controls that could be exploited to gain access to information or an information system. So why is vulnerability management important? Because the SANS Institute says so. <laughs> they have a document called the Top 20 Critical Security Controls. These are a simplified list of actions to help an organization assess and or improve their security posture. Specifically here, number four, continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation. The point of which is to continuously acquire, assess, and take action on new information in order to identify vulnerabilities, remediate, and minimize the window of opportunity for attackers. It's also important because there's a constant stream of threat intelligence around us. It's coming from many sources. We'll get to some of those sources here in a minute. And failing to keep pace with these just allows for easier exploitation. For example, there's a zero-day vulnerability published. Assuming that it's not published in a responsible manner, the information is available to all parties at once. And then we have a three-way race between the attackers to weaponize and exploit, the vendors to develop and deploy patches and their updates, and the defenders to implement defensive measures, whatever those may be. So my context here, my practical experience, is with a retail grocery client of ours up in Charlotte. This client has about 45,000 devices and they're running everything from Windows to AIX, Cisco, Juniper, Apple, Android, and countless applications on these devices. So when we started, the hallmark of the vulnerability management program was very, very reactionary. Okay. So, this scenario. An existing vulnerability was discovered. So what do you think happened? Woo -hoo -hoo! Ran around with their hair on fire, like everything was all crazy. So, we pursued the vulnerability until it was remediated or the risk was accepted. So, our next scenario. There's a possibly applicable vulnerability. So something's out there, it might apply to us, it might not. So, what happened? Woo, all kind of crazy. Once again, because we don't have anything else going on. Yay! So again, panic mode was activated. There's my panic slide. <laughs> Here we go. And again, everybody's hair was on fire and we tracked the vulnerability until we reached some kind of remediation. In this process, it was ultimately effective. It ultimately did exactly what we needed it to do but it was incredibly inefficient and simply exhausting to everybody involved, especially the security team who had to facilitate the whole thing. So from the experience here, I came away with three primary components to vulnerability management. The first of which, vulnerability discovery. So we'll talk about that one first. Vulnerability notification. So taking the information we get from discovering vulnerabilities and passing it to those responsible for mediation. And finally, remediation verification. So ensuring that remediation is indeed complete. So the first goal when we started this program was to improve our vulnerability discovery. So the first step, first thing we did was deploy a vulnerability scan. So Rapid7 Expos is what we used. And that helped us identify existing assets, vulnerabilities, and configuration issues. And one of the first things we, we did after we got it stood up, completely implemented, was run a discovery scan of all internal assets. Now the client operates a slash eight network, so nearly 17 million IP addresses. So this thing took weeks and weeks and weeks to run. But when it came away, we had an IP address for all hosts. We had an OS fingerprint that was, for one of those devices, we knew it was gonna be right. Everything else was kinda give and take. And on usually one of those devices, it would give us a host name as well. And then using that information, we could create credential scans. So we would create a Windows service account and it would scan these devices and come back with information useful for mostly Windows. And it would analyze uh, system configurations, open ports and protocols, and create a software inventory for each device where those credentials were valid. 
and you would still do discovery scans to help identify any rogue assets that pop up. So the next aspect to improving vulnerability discovery is reviewing newly published vulnerabilities. And to do this, we use many sources. First, the National Vulnerability Database, or NVD, which is a multi-format downloadable vulnerability listing. We get this database on a weekly basis and compare it with previous weeks and look at the difference between the weeks. This was especially fun the first time we did it and had to go through years and years and years of information to try and figure out what applies to us and what we need to address. Now, secondly, United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team, or US CERT, that's the Division of Homeland Security, and they provide notification services and also a weekly security bulletin. Next up, vendor-specific alerts. So Microsoft's Patch Tuesday falls in here, as well as those from Cisco, VMware, Oracle, et cetera, which are released on a regular schedule and or as vulnerabilities are published. Uh, the next source was uh, research and aggregation sources, uh, ThreatPost, CSO Online, and CyberLearn, a few examples here. Also, we took into account anything that we found out through our penetration test we have performed. And finally, social media. So Brian Krebs, Security Week, Katie Masuris, uh, if you want the latest, greatest security information, Twitter's where you hang out. So thanks to these sources, we've identified some vulnerabilities. So what now? The next aspect for us to consider was resource allocation. How can we prioritize our resources in a way that reflects the specific needs of our organization? First, we considered how the vulnerabilities are scored by the industry. So the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, or the CVSS. And that's an open framework for communicating the characteristics and severity of software vulnerabilities. It uses three primary metrics. You got base, the intrinsic qualities of a vulnerability, the temporal aspects of a vulnerability that may change over time, and environmental aspects specific to an organization's environment. It uses a 10 point scale, as you can see here. And CBSS version 3 introduced dynamic components, and that allows for adjustment of the score based on these environmental factors. Um, we considered this, but found this method of calculation to be too cumbersome and time consuming for us to use. And also, it was very subjective, so two people looking at the same vulnerability might come away with different scores for the same thing. So, the dynamic component calculations look like this. But it feels a lot like this. Math, am I right? So, we devised an alternate simplified calculation scheme. The adjusted scoring system. Uh, my acronym needs some work. It's a work in progress. <laughs> uh, the purpose behind this was to take into account the CVSS score, and factors specific to the organization. Uh, there are three factors we considered with a maximum potential score of 10. So we would take this 10 points, combine it with the CVSS 10 points, and average that to get an enterprise specific score. So the first and largest factor we looked at was external accessibility. Can any of the assets affected be reached from outside the organization? If just one could, it got four points, but if all the assets were internal only, it got zero. Next up, data sensitivity. So we have all three uh, sensitive data types here in our environment. So PCI, PHI, and PII. Uh, PCI, we gave it the most weight because compliance. Uh, PHI, this uh, grocery store also operates a pharmacy, so we had to consider that as well. And uh, PII, personally identifiable information. You can see they were scored um, like this, and they're mutually exclusive. So if a system had data types all three, only the highest point level would take effect there. Uh, finally, we took into account prevalence in the enterprise. So if you were to implement this elsewhere, you would need to look at the size of your organization and adjust this. We found an optimal scale for us was 50 or more devices, three points, uh, 20 to 49, two points, and less than 20 got one point. So by implementing our adjusted scoring system, we go from this <coughs> to this. Much simpler, right? So let's take a good look at a practical example of our adjusted scoring system. So this is one that actually happened. Uh, this client of ours uses ICE. And AnyConnect is the supplicant. So tons and tons of devices with this. And it's uh, 2017 6638 uh, AnyConnect RCE. So we had all these devices. And they were internal only. None of them could be accessed from outside the organization directly. Um, so, and they were within PCI scope and way more than 50 devices. So we did our math here and came away with an adjusted score of 6.9. So it knocked it down from a high to a medium, which, you know, what's, what's the huge value in that? But it helped us prioritize over everything else that was coming in. Uh, now that we have our adjusted score, we need to determine if the vulnerability should even be addressed and the timeline. So that's the 10-point scale we talked about a second ago. Um, low, remediation not required. 
Uh, medium, high, and critical, they must be addressed. Medium within 90 days, and high and critical within 30 days. So, now we've scored and prioritized our vulnerabilities, now we need, and we've determined the timeline for remediation, what do we do then? And then, so, we needed to take the information that we got and present it to those responsible for remediation. So this client has about half a dozen administrative teams to address vulnerabilities at different levels. And we needed to find the best way to get this information to them. Uh, we limited the vulnerabilities presented to 10 per team per month. Some of them had last, less than 10, some of them had uh, close to 60. So we needed a way to uh, condense that down to make it easier for them to address and not try and kill themselves trying to address them all at one time. Uh, so to get to these 10, we would start with an exposed report, super helpful, uh, top 25 remediation with details, and we'd combine these reports with other sources and create two documents. Now the first one was a spreadsheet, and the spreadsheet overview uh, gave them an at-a-glance view of the 10 vulnerabilities. And we found that was helpful for them just to kind of get at first glance. This is what we need to do. All right, and the next one was a Word doc. So it laid out all the information that was in the first document, but got down into the weeds about the CVEs and the suggested remediations. And basically, all the information that they would need to address it, we wanted to give that to them in this document. All right, now that we assembled the reports, we scheduled team meetings. So two meetings per team per month. We would meet, go over the documents, and we would involve the administrative team and their manager and director. We found that the higher up we went, the more effective our program was for obvious reasons. And so then we would have a follow-up meeting two weeks later. And we would, again, go over those two documents, but the team would update it with their planned course of action. In the response document, we found that there were four possible responses they could give us. Not applicable to our organization. We could throw it out and move on. Now, false positive can be disregarded. Applicable and can be remediated within 90 days for critical or high and 90 days for medium. And finally, applicable but cannot be remediated in the predetermined time frame or at all. So when we got to these, we would do a risk acceptance plan. So why do we need a risk acceptance plan? The idea with a risk acceptance plan is to relate all information necessary to senior management so that they could sign off on it. The IS department does not accept risk. The IS department does not accept risk. One more time. The IS department does not accept risk. <laughs> That's all senior management to do. So at no point should you say, just shrug your shoulders and say, yeah, I guess we're okay with that one. No. You've got to run it up through senior management to have them sign off on it. So what constitutes senior management? A good rule of thumb here is the person most likely to get fired if it goes sideways. <laughs> so... What goes in a risk acceptance plan? So we have all our documentation, and we have our description for the vulnerability, so that includes the CVEs, I suggest remediation, what could be done to fix it, uh, your platforms, your scope, how many devices were affected, and what um, platform, so operating system, and also uh, what applications would be affected here. And you basically want to lay out your worst case scenario to manage it. And after all the bad, then you can lay out the good, your mitigating controls. That includes your IDS IPS, your firewalls, your AV software, network segmentation, physical access controls, and my personal favorite, application whitelisting. If you don't have application whitelisting, you don't need to look into it. So, let's talk about remediation. So now we get to the third and, fi and final component, remediation verification, ensuring that remediation is complete. So we discovered vulnerability and remediation has been reported by the administrative team. That's fantastic. That's what we were looking for. So in these cases, it's up to the security team or whoever's facilitating to obtain evidence. So what constitutes evidence? If you found the vulnerability with a vulnerability scan, then you can just rerun the scan if they say they fixed it. Easy enough, no problem. Um, if it was discovered outside your vulnerability scanner, it makes it a little bit more difficult because you don't have any proof that you're vulnerable, so how do you get proof that you're not? Um, so patch level screenshots uh, help a lot here as well as vendor reports. So that's like your uh, Microsoft MBSA, Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. Uh, also, uh, this client uses F5, so load balancing software, and they have their own tool where you can export the configuration into this and it will spit out, here's all the patches that are missing, here's your configuration issues. That was helpful to us as well. So we wanted to make sure that remediation could be verified by any means available. Well, let's take a look at a few examples. 
Uh, in one instance, uh, Netspose notified us that many Windows devices were missing a critical patch. Not surprising. So the administrative team acknowledged, said they were working on it, but a while later they confirmed that remediation was complete. Nextpost scan confirmed this. Here's a problem. There were some devices that weren't being scanned. They had stood up more devices in a different subnet that wasn't being scanned. And it was partly on them for not communicating, but partly on us for not doing our discovery scans, which we do now. Uh, in another case, vulnerability was discovered outside of Nextpost, so a whole other animal. The administrative team was notified and their response was not applicable. We're not using the configuration that would be vulnerable to this. Um, however, we discovered later that it was very much applicable. Um, and this could have been prevented by having multiple people check it. Because the first time we had one guy checking it, the second time uh, we had a different guy. And you know, having them work together from the outset would have prevented us from missing this. So now that we've discussed my experience here, let me go into some recommendations for anybody wanting to spin up vulnerability management in your organization. Uh, first of all, bring in a consulting firm to perform an initial assessment based on the SANS Top 20 Critical Security Controls that we talked about a minute ago. These items include, uh, number one, your hardware inventory, so inventory of unauthorized and unauthorized devices. Number two, inventory of unauthorized and unauthorized software. And number four, continuous vulnerability assessment and remediation, all three of which we talked about already. A second recommendation, stand up your vulnerability scanner. This compatible with most, if not all, I seriously doubt that the vulnerability scanner will be compatible with all devices in your environment. Uh, do your discovery scan first, um, like I talked about earlier, and it's uh, recommended for your per first pass because it's minimally invasive and relatively quick. It'll take some time to complete, but uh, and a full discovery scan will be worth it to get an understanding of what assets are out there. And then using this information, you can do your credential scans where you get more information about the devices. Uh, based on the size of your organization, uh, you want to break these down by IP range or a geographical location, um, organizational unit, or even asset type. Uh, next recommendation, create device hardening standards. The CIS benchmarks are a good way to do this. Um, and they provide specific guidance for hardening assets based on the operating system it's running. And these are provided for a wide array of uh, devices. So Linux, IBM, Microsoft operating systems. So every flavor of Linux, or most flavors of Linux, every flavor of Microsoft. And also uh, iOS, switch firewall router, and uh, multifunction devices as well. Uh, some vulnerability scanners, like Nexpose and Nessus, can run a specific type of credential scan against the device and can come back with a report um, that details pass or fail for each item. Uh, Nessus has this cool offline capability where you can import a config file from an iOS device and it will come back with a report showing you the pass fail for each device. Uh, they're incredibly beneficial uh, for evaluating the security of whatever device that you, uh, that you want to evaluate. Uh, next recommendation, uh, hire a professional penetration testing firm. If you need one, I know one. Uh, the focus here should be on externally available assets, uh, anything that might be um, evaluated as part of your compliance process, uh, and anything with sensitive data. Uh, if these recommendations are a little bit too resource intensive for your organization, uh, consider software as a service. And these are great because they don't uh, require infrastructure investment, and you can focus your time on using the application instead of deploying it or administering it or maintaining it. Uh, so our key concept here, the key to the information security program, especially vulnerability management, is to build it around goals and strategies. Not a tool, not a set of tools, but a vulnerability scanner is incredibly insightful. If you've never used one, you stand one up and scan with it, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But it can miss something. Vulnerability scanners often miss things. And when I say often, I mean always. Uh, the US CERT and NVD that we talked about a minute ago, they're super robust. They give you tons of information but can't possibly tell you everything you need to know about your organization. Uh, vendor notifications, equally valuable, but they can account for existing configuration issues. So one's approach to vulnerability management must be comprehensive. Cover as many areas as possible. Concerted, all teams working together towards the goal of vulnerability mitigation. Customized, specific to your organization. And here's where the adjusted scoring system helps. Also consistent, the same for all teams, all vulnerabilities, and all circumstances. 
Uh, if you do decide to undertake this, there will be times when you say, you kind of shrug your shoulders and want to say, oh, that's close enough, or that's not something we need to worry about. But the more consistent and regular your process, the higher your likelihood of ultimate success. Uh, also, changeable. So initially, constant changes will be required to your program. It's like you've heard the phrase, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. Vulnerability management is very much like that. And inevitably, your plan is going to require modifications on its first attempts. So in conclusion, vulnerability management can be a powerful tool for reshaping an IS department. Engaging in a cyclical process of identifying vulnerabilities and notifying persons responsible for addressing them and tracking remediation to completion has the potential to vastly improve an organization's security posture. Any questions? Cool. Well, I'm Eric Bryan. I'm contacting um, at the methods uh, listed there. Um, I appreciate you guys inviting me to uh, speak, and uh, y'all have a great day.